what we'll be preaching on this evening is the topic of the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. So we'll be explaining this passage and, and what it means in case you're not quite sure exactly what it means. And uh, you know, maybe you already do know, but one of the reasons why this is important is that every once in a while, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it's important besides just being doctrinal and biblical, what, you know, the meaning of this. Uh, there's a few things that come up oftentimes out solely. And this isn't one of the topics that comes up, I would say, very frequently, but occasionally it does come up. And I want to start off with this because I want to give you a tip or a pointer on how to deal with this when, if you go to the door and someone, you ask somebody, you know for sure you died today, you're going to heaven, right? And then they say yes, and they ask why. If they give you the right answer, right? They say, well, because I believe in Jesus or something to that effect, right? Um, when you follow up with, usually what you do is you follow up with asking them about eternal security. Well, is there any way you could lose it? Every once in a while, you'll get someone that says, well, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, then you can lose it. Now, that shows me, first of all, right away, that they're not just completely ignorant of Scripture. They've heard stuff before. They've at least, you know, heard his talk. Now, they may have a misunderstanding of what this is really talking about, but I don't always assume that that person's unsaved. I think people can just get a little bit confused on that because at least there's some type of scripture, and we see it's very powerful what the what the Bible says about you know whoever blasphemes the Holy Ghost. It says they don't have any forgiveness in this world, neither in the world to come. And it's just like point blank, like that's a fact. So if someone looks at that and they don't quite understand what it means, and they go, well, I mean, I know if I blaspheme the Holy Ghost that I don't have eternal life because it's pretty clear. If that's their reason, and that's like their only reason, I usually will try to explain them you know, kind of what this passage means. Or, before I even go into explaining that, what I prefer to do is ask a few more follow-up questions is, was there anything else that you could do? Right? Just to make sure they're not trusting in the law, trusting in anything else for their salvation. Now, obviously, it's wrong to think that a believer can lose their salvation. That's incorrect. That's not what this verse is teaching. But if that is the only thing they come up with, I'm not going to say, oh, that person wasn't saved. You just try to expound it then unto them. And usually what I do, like I said, I try to, to just make sure, first of all, is there anything else? And I'll just bring up an example and just say, well, what if, uh, you know, what if someone were to kill someone? Or what, you know, like, would you lose it for that? And just, just kind of really make sure you, you nail it down as to what they believe. Because if they misunderstand this, before you even go and explain it, if they're already thinking they can lose their salvation for other things, it's way easier to go into why you can't lose your salvation in general, you know, why that's a works-based salvation, than it is to try to expound this one passage. Because this is a little bit deeper. This, you have to go and explain more for this then you would, um, like you don't normally teach this to someone when you're out soul So if they're not saved, there's no point really going into this level of detail. But if this is the only thing they say and, and it seems pretty comfortable, like, yeah, I think this person is saved, they just don't understand it, then definitely teach them and show them this passage and what it's actually talking about. So I just wanted to kind of start off with that right off the bat, just to give you a little bit of insight onto, you know, just through experience, because I've gone in the past and tried to explain this to people before I realized, well, well, this person's, I mean, they're trusting in works anyways. They might have mentioned this, but it was one of, of other things that you can do also. Um, and before we dig into this completely, I also want to talk just a little bit about demon possession, because that's what we see Jesus is being accused of. <clears throat> so let's reread part of this passage. We're going to start here in verse number 24. And let's get the full <coughs> context of what's going on here. The Bible says, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So Jesus is without doubt casting out devils. The Pharisees can see it. The people around can see it. You know, there's, Jesus walks up sometimes, and there's devils just crying out, What are we to do with thee, thou Son of God? We know who thou art. Thou art the Son of God. You know, you're the Son of the Highest. And we see this throughout Scripture that 
The demons were saying this to him as he just comes on the scene. And in other you know, places we see he's casting out devils and he's healing people. And, and, and this is a fact. This is happening. It's going on. No one can deny it. So because they can't deny it, but because they still refuse to believe on Jesus Christ, because they still refuse to believe that he's coming from the Father, that he is of the Father, they have the only explanation they have at this point is to say, well, the only reason he's able to cast out devils is because he's of the devil anyways. So they're listening to him because he's in the devil authority and he's able to cast out these other devils. That's basically what they're accusing Jesus Christ of. That he's, he's, he's casting out devils by Beelzebub, by Satan himself. That what he's doing is actually not of the Father, it's of Satan. Which is extremely wicked. And, and we'll get into that a little bit more as to why the, the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is, is an un pardonable sin. There is no forgiveness for that. Because this isn't a, a light thing. It's a really big deal. But let's, let's keep reading here. That's what they're accusing him. So when Jesus knows this, <coughs> verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? So he's saying this doesn't even make any sense. I mean, if Satan's work is to go and to possess people and do harm and do damage, why is he going to send people to do the exact opposite of, of what he's trying to do? Like, it really doesn't make any sense at all. He said, a house divided isn't going to stand. and They're going to be in conjunction of working together, not completely opposed to each other and fighting against each other. That makes no sense. It says in verse number 27, And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom be your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. So he said, okay. So if it's a power of Satan, well, I'm casting out devils. And what about your children? They're, they're casting out devils too. So are they, are they under the influence of Satan as well? Verse 28, But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. He tosses out their idea as being ridiculous that it would be of Satan. And he's saying, on the other hand, if I am doing this under the power of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. And he's pinning them down like, you, you have to make a decision on this. And uh, <coughs> because there's no middle ground. There is no in-between. The fact that supernatural things are happening and he's casting out devils is undeniable. So it's either of God, which it definitely is, or what they're claiming, well, that's just of the devil. Verse 29, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? <laughs> he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Now, I just want to touch on this verse real quickly about entering into a strong man's house. He's given this kind of as an example or a parable. Obviously, if someone's going to rob a house, what he's saying is that if you've got a strong guy that lives inside, you're going to need to take care of deal with him first before you can go in and, and do whatever you want in his house. So you have to tie him up. You have to bind him up, right? That's what a lot of thieves do. They, they break into someone's house. They find people in there. They tie them up. They take what they want. They get out of there, whatever. That just makes sense. <coughs> but what he's applying this to then is, is what I believe is being possessed of devils. Like if this is Jesus Christ that's being under the influence of Satan and he's by the power of Satan, he's casting out devils, then that would mean he's possessed of the devil himself. And in order for a, a demon or a devil to possess someone, it says first they have to bind that strong man. And... I believe the scripture teaches that when you're saved, it is impossible for you to be demon-possessed. And keep your place here, because we're going to come right back. This is our main passage for tonight. Flip over real quick to 1 John chapter 5. But I want to point out, too, though, as far as the unsaved world's concerned, you know, this is talking about binding a strong man in order for... You know, people break in, but I believe that you know, the demon that come into your house. You know, our, our body is our vessel. This is our house. This is, you know, the Bible calls it the temple of the Holy Ghost. When you're saved, your body is that temple. But it's, it's like a house. It's, it's the, the vessel that we possess or inhabit as human beings, what our soul possesses, or our soul inhabits, our body, right? So in order for 
a demon or devil to possess someone, I believe that person needs to be bound, and it's not obviously a physical binding. But the Bible talks about sin as bringing us into bondage. And what you'll find probably all the time is that people who are possessed of devils are in some type of serious bondage to sin. Oftentimes they'll be alcoholics or drug addicts or things like that, that they've been brought into bondage of that sin, that making it that much easier because that weakens that person and allows them to be inhabited then by a devil. Now, if a believer is weakened or in the bondage of sin, I mean, we're free from sin in, in the sense that Jesus Christ has paid for all of our sins, right? And because we have Christ, because we have the Holy Ghost dwelling within us, it is impossible for a devil to move in. The Bible says that you know, all the believers, that we, we get indwelled by the Holy Ghost. The Bible teaches that. And in 1 John chapter 5, let me turn there myself. This is our memory passage. The Bible says in verse number 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? We overcome the world. Satan's not going to overcome us inside of our bodies when we've already overcome the world. But even furthermore, when you jump down to... Um, <coughs> Verse number 10, the Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Right. He that believeth not God is made of a liar because he believeth not the record God gave of his Son. When you believe on Jesus Christ, the witness, that witness that we're just talking about earlier, you know, it says there's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. We receive a witness in ourselves. The Bible says like the God, the Spirit of God the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that, we're, that we are the children of God. That we are saved. So we have God's spirit residing in us which makes it impossible because the devil can't overcome Jesus. The devil can't overcome the power of the Holy Ghost. There are no devils out there that have that much power to overcome God. And if God is residing in you, God in you, that hope of glory residing in you, there's no way any devil can ever take possession of the possession that's already been bought and paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a bought and paid for possession of, of God. He's not going to allow some devil to take possession of you. That's what being possessed is. You're being controlled. You're being possessed. You're becoming a possession of a devil. Makes sense, right? Because they then start controlling your body and your actions. It's impossible for a believer to ever get into that condition. But let's flip back to Matthew chapter 12 because I want I just kind of want to cover that real briefly because this same concept is taught in other passages about, about people being devil-possessed with a strong man <coughs> being spoiled except they be bound first. Let's keep reading here in verse number 30. The Bible says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus Christ, Son of Man. So he says, anyone that speaks a word against the Son of Man, can that be forgiven? If someone says something bad about Jesus Christ, can that be forgiven him? Yes. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. You know what I love about this verse? It's just one more verse that teaches the Trinity. If Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost, is the Father, this doesn't even make any sense. How, how can it be that you can be forgiven of one and not forgiven of the other if, there's, if they're just exactly one. Makes no sense whatsoever. That's why I want to point that out, because Jesus is being very clear. I mean, and, and, and think about that, too. Like, um, think about how many people blaspheme Jesus Christ just in the world. There's a lot of blasphemy against Jesus Christ in the world. I'm glad that God is merciful enough 
and long suffering enough to, to even allow that because he doesn't have to allow that he definitely doesn't deserve that but he allows that but he says once you start blaspheming the Holy Ghost you, that's, that's the line that he drew he said there's no forgiveness now that's it and I think there's a few reasons for that, but one of the things that we see, and this is why I, I take a position, I don't know for certain if people can blaspheme the Holy Ghost today. I, you probably can. I kind of think that you still can. But, I mean, I know people become reprobate. Because that's what we're dealing with here, too, as well. We're dealing with the reprobate doctrine. People who, reprobate means rejected. It means you can no longer be saved. And as long as I'm on that subject now, I'm going to cover that in a few minutes. This is also a great passage to take note of if you're discussing the reprobate doctrine with other believers, people who are saved, but they <laughs> don't agree with that doctrine. This is a very, very good place to start with them to explain the doctrine because usually what happens is people who are maybe tied in with the old IFB or just anyone. It doesn't matter who they're tied up with. It doesn't matter where they're getting their teaching from. If they're a saved, if a believer, born again, child of God, they can understand the scripture. They may have been taught a, a, a wrong way for a while in different areas. But if we can show people scripture, if they're born again, hey, it's the same voice of the shepherd. It's the word of God. The word of God is powerful. So they ought to as long as they're willing to let God's word lead them and teach them, they ought to be able to receive this doctrine without any problems. Because it is very scriptural. And if you could bring someone here, because <clears throat> normally people freak out because they've been taught that anyone can get saved for as long as they live is one of the core teachings that people just kind of had ingrained in their head. You can, all the way up until your last day, your dying breath, you can get saved. Because God wants everyone to be saved. It's just a little bit of a misunderstanding. Now, most people can be saved until they're, they're dying. Breath, but not everybody can. And then they also freak out because we believe that sodomites are reprobates. Homosexuals are reprobates. That they're done as no, So they think, no, 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 they can still be saved. I heard this guy on YouTube once. It used to be a homo. And he, you know, whatever. So they have their various reasons why they believe what they believe. And then they don't like it. They'll just write off. The whole topic of can someone, you know, is there even such a thing as someone being a reprobate? Right. Well, if you got someone that doesn't understand this doctrine or rejects the doctrine, what about Matthew 12? When the Bible says in verse number 32, in verse number 31, wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. It's not even just talking about this temporary type of forgiveness. It's very clear in Scripture. Because we have other verses that deal with our standing with God as a child of God, do we not? Right? Where... Um, we can be forgiven of things that we do here, even though we're already eternally forgiven, right? This is clearly not referring to one of those times where because we're in the flesh, we sin against God, but we're saved anyways. This is talking about the world to come, saying you still don't have forgiveness, okay? We can sin in this world and maybe not be forgiven and God takes our life or something, but if you're born again, you're saved, you're forgiven in the world to come. Like, this, that's, that's not going to be mentioned to you. That's part of the old man. But <clears throat> the fact that he mentions that you cannot be forgiven even in the world to come, that's, that's, that's clear that this person is damned. And they'll say, well, what, what if someone blasphemes? And this is someone something that asks these people to get them thinking. First of all, do you believe this? If someone blasphemes the Holy Ghost, are they damned or not? Absolutely. Can they be forgiven? No. What if they put their faith in Jesus Christ later? They'll say, well, what do you do then? Well, then you're going to have a contradiction. If someone today blasphemes the Holy Ghost, according to Scripture, they don't have forgiveness now, 
or in the world to come. But then tomorrow, the same person says, oh, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Well, we know that once a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ, they have what? Eternal life. All of their sins are forgiven, right? Well, how can all of your sins be forgiven if the Bible says that this cannot be forgiven? You have a contradiction. One verse doesn't trump another verse as being more true. They both have to be true in order for this to be God's word and for it to even make sense. So there's a very simple way of reconciling this is that the person that blasphemes the Holy Ghost, they weren't saved already because otherwise they'd have eternal life and this verse couldn't apply to them. So they're unsaved and they cannot believe after they blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Because if they could, then they would have to be able to receive eternal life because that's all that's required to receive eternal life. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is where I'm not going to teach and preach the entire reprobate doctrine. That's, again, subject for another day. But this is a great, this is, this is one of the best places, in my opinion, to, to go to people that believe the Bible, they're born again, but they reject the reprobate doctrine. Because you can teach this so clearly. Just break it down like I'm doing right now for them. And try to get them to stay with you. Don't jump off to other verses. Don't jump off topic. Stay with this one and try to hammer it home. To get them to understand and just to admit. In this situation, before you even go and say, how does somebody do that? Just say, well, does this, is, does this situation exist? Is that what this means? Because once you, because this is so clear. Once you accept this, you can say, okay. So even if this doesn't happen today, at least at some point, there existed this idea of someone who was reprobate. There existed somebody who could not get saved. Once you get started on that, then you can start showing other examples. Like in Revelation 22, when anyone adds to the word, to the prophecy of this book, God shall add unto him the plagues that are found in this book. And if anyone shall remove the words of the book, it's probably their place, their, their part shall be removed out of the, the book of life, out of the holy city, and I, I don't have the whole verse memorized word of verbatim, but you know what verse I'm talking about. So right there, if someone changes or tampers with God's word, they're, they're blotted out. Can they be saved? Or what about a person who, as long as you're in Revelation, just turn to the mark of the beast? You turn to Revelation 14 and look at that and say, hey, if someone takes the mark of the beast, the Bible says that they're going to be tortured and tormented forever and ever and ever. Who so worshipeth the beast or, or taketh the mark of his name. Once someone takes the mark, can they still be saved? Of course not. Because again, then you're contradicting script. Then that verse can't be true when it says that all that take the mark of the beast, everyone that takes that mark, it provides no exceptions. You, can't, you cannot... Twist that or change that. So we have three examples, very clear examples in Scripture of people who definitely cannot be saved. Now is it really that hard to take the next step of just saying, look, these people are all reprobates. Is it possible that maybe there are other people that can become reprobate also, maybe for a different reason? And once you understand and accept the concept, because it's clearly taught in Scripture, then it's a lot easier to say. And if they never want to accept that homos can't be saved, whatever, right? That's not, that's, the point is just at least teach this doctrine. This isn't some crazy doctrine. This isn't something that, because what happens is a lot of people lie about what we believe. And it causes believers in Christ then to not want to fellowship when they, when they ought to, when, when, hey, you're a soul winner, I'm a soul winner, we love God, you love God, right? But they've been, we've been lied about for, for, with particular doctrines, and they misunderstand what it is that we believe. There's, oh, you're at it, works of salvation, because you think someone's got to keep the law, and they can't do this, or else, you know. No. Take the time to explain it to them, <coughs> and start here in Matthew chapter 12, because it makes perfect sense. Very reasonable. Very reasonable place. Now, let's continue going here. Um, <coughs> verse number 33. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, 
or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. Like, this is interesting. We just went over this morning, very similar example. And who is he talking to? Verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard it, he's talking to the Pharisees that are blaspheming the Holy Ghost about Jesus. And now he's bringing up again the tree and the fruit. He's not talking to your average person here either. He's talking about false prophets. False prophets that are reprobates. Because if they weren't already before, Jesus is already saying basically that they sealed their faith. Verse 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You know what he's saying there? They can't speak good things. Because they're evil. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. That's very strong language, something to take very seriously, just in general for everybody. Hey, you know, your words matter. And you get a lot of people who want to mock the Bible and, and you know, record themselves on YouTube saying, I don't know how you do this, but however you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, I'm blast, you know. Those words are going to come back to haunt those people. They think, ha ha, this is just stupid, it's all silly and stuff, it doesn't mean anything. Until Judgment Day and they're standing before the King. And now you are being judged by your words. And you thought it was just some idle thing, you thought it was just some no big deal. Well, it is a big deal. And this is something that is such a big deal that you can seal your faith. Right. Now, the reason why I believe that this is such a serious sin is because, I mean, if you think about it, you think about everything that's going on, think about being on this earth when Jesus Christ was walking around. Just imagine yourself being on the scene, living in Jerusalem, right? And there's a guy who is traveling around ministering to people, <clears throat> preaching the word of God, healing people who've had sicknesses, diseases, and you're witnessing this stuff. He's casting out devils. I mean, all this stuff, right? And to look at all of the good that's being done and just say, that's of the devil. Satan's doing that. Satan's healing people. Satan's casting out devils. It's insanity. It really is insanity. It's people who probably were already reprobate or they just hate God so much and they're so stuck in their religion that this is the point they become reprobate because they've just lost their mind into having to call something like that of the devil. I don't see how anyone can do it. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone who saw those things got saved and put their trust in the Savior. But there's a huge difference between not understanding the gospel, not putting your faith in the gospel, not putting your faith in Jesus, and just saying that what Jesus is doing was of the devil. And it wasn't Jesus, because Jesus was operating under, under the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's why you blaspheme the Holy Ghost when you say the, the things that Jesus did was of the devil that he's under the influence or power of the devil. No, he was under the influence and power of the Holy Ghost. That's where the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost comes in, because you're basically calling the Holy Ghost Satan. And let's just cover blasphemy real quick. I was going to cover Mark chapter 3. It's just, uh, we don't need to go there though. It's just another uh, parallel passage with Matthew chapter 12. But uh, in Luke, turn to, to Leviticus 24 real quick. I'll read for you from Luke 12 because it's important to just kind of cover this as well. Um, what is blasphemy? The Bible says in Luke 12, 10, which is another parallel passage for Matthew um, 12, 12, what we just read. It says, And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. So he's comparing, right, being forgiven, not being forgiven. So he's talking about the same thing. In this, in this verse, 
comparing the Son of Man to the Holy Ghost, right? If you do this against the Son of Man, okay, you can be forgiven. If you do this against the Holy Ghost, you can't be forgiven. And the words he uses, though, he says, speak a word against the Son of Man versus blaspheming. So blaspheming is when you're speaking against, deriding, um, reviling, right? God. When you're, when, you're, when you're saying these, these wicked things or bad things, speaking against, that's blasphemy. And we'll get, I'm, I'm going to give you a few more verses here. The biggest 24 is one of them. Just to, to wrap your mind around what blasphemy is. Just so we understand the concept of what it actually means to blaspheme. Because it's, it's not a word that's used very frequently. And even when it is used, there's still some kind of, I think, some un, uncertainty or clarity on what the word actually means. Because people will... You hear someone just use a, a swear word and people will say, you're blaspheming or something, and that's just that's not true. If someone uses a four-letter word that's, that's not deemed to be a, a good word in our society, in, in you know, respectable society, it doesn't, you're not blaspheming. Not necessarily. Depends on the context, right? If, if it has to do with, like, you're saying something against God and you're using, you know, foul language then yeah, you're blasphemy, but it's not because of those, you know, that specific word, it's because of what you're, what the context is. Uh, Leviticus 24, verse number 10, the Bible says, And the son of an Israelitish woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel, and the son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. So you got this guy, his dad is an Egyptian. His mom's uh, uh, of Israel, but his dad's an Egyptian, and he's fighting with another man of Israel, and they're, they're fighting together, in verse number 11, and the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. He's cursing God. He's, he's bringing up and making a curse about God, like just saying, you know, your God is a real whatever, whatever it is. It's not a, you know, it's, he's bringing up this curse. And they brought him unto Moses, and his mother's name was Shalomith, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in war that the mind of the Lord might be showed him. Showed them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. So we see now even more clearly what the curse was. He's cursing God. These guys are fighting together, and he curses God. It's a pretty serious offense, and it's so serious that the Bible puts the death penalty on him. Even in God's law, he's, he's helping us to understand the gravity of particular sins. And he's saying, you blaspheme God, you're going to be put to death. And we see in the New Testament, you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you can't even be forgiven. Talk about how important God's name is, and who God is. It's, I mean, it, it is the most important, the first two commandments. Don't have any other gods before me, right? What is it that makes God jealous when his people go and worship other gods? What is it that even gets people turned reprobate? Romans chapter 1, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, became vain in their own imagination, the foolish heart was darkened. And they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. They're turning to idols. They're turning to false gods. And in that process, reject the God of the Bible. When they understand the God of the Bible, they reject the God of the Bible, and they, they turn to these false gods and this idolatry and become reprobate. Verse number 16 there says, and He that blasphemeth in the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him. As well the stranger as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. So this is all about someone who's cursing God. He's cursing God and the people. And the Bible is saying, look, the whole congregation just gets involved with this. Your congregation loves God. You're going to hate when someone blasphemes the name of God. And he's saying they need to be put to death. It's a serious crime. Uh, one last passage. I'll read this for you. Luke 22, the Bible says in verse 63, And the men that helped Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? So they're making fun of Jesus. 
these guards have them blindfolded and then they're hitting them and just, you know, I mean, just imagine you have your eyes covered and just pow! And they're just like, oh, oh you're a preacher, yeah, prophesy unto us, why don't you tell us who hit you? You can't see anything, right? Just totally mocking him and ridiculing him, hitting him, no respect. It says, and many other things blasphemously spake they against him. Why is that blasphemy? Because Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Because he is a prophet. And they're making fun of him. They're deriding him. They're railing on him. They're blaspheming him. Now, according to Scripture, these people can still be saved. They're blaspheming the name of Jesus. But they're not necessarily blaspheming the Holy Ghost. We don't, you know, we don't, not in this story. We don't see that. But it's a, it's a big deal. Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. You know, can it still be done today? I think probably so, because anyone who's doing power under the Holy Ghost, if someone were, if a similar situation were to happen, and someone were saying that's of the devil, you know, the, the work that's being done of the Holy Ghost is of the devil. I mean, the Bible says the spirit that quickened it. If you're out winning souls to Christ and someone witnesses what's going on and they're saying, that's of the devil. To me, that sounds like a case of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And I, I would not want to be in that person's shoes. I mean, we may not be performing the miracles of healing people at Jesus' name, right? But either, regardless, it's the Holy Ghost that's doing the work. I mean, when we're out preaching the gospel, the Holy Ghost is the one that's, that's doing the work. So it's a pretty simple subject. It's not a very long sermon tonight. But it's one that I think a lot of Christians don't have a very good grasp and understanding of this concept of blasphemy and the Holy Ghost. And I know for, like, for a while it tripped me up because I believe once saved, always saved. Since I got saved, right? I mean, it's something that you kind of have to believe. I didn't understand all the ins and outs of it, but I knew that I was saved. I knew I couldn't lose it, whatever. But then you come across those ideas like, well, what does that really mean? Because, you know, it's just more of this kind of, I don't even know. I didn't even know what it meant for a long time. But <clears throat> the more you start to understand the reprobate doctrine and things like that, it starts to be a little bit more clear. It's hard to understand how can someone just be not forgiven forever. Like, I'm forgiven. Well, what if, what if I did that? Well, you can't. You can't. And that's actually something that you can't do. A believer will not ever blaspheme the Holy Ghost, by the way. Yes, we have free will, but this is just something that there would be no reason. You have the Spirit in yourself if you're saved. It's bearing witness with you that you are saved and is there with you won't you won't do it you can't do it and I think if it ever even got to a voice point where, where it was possible that happened God would probably just end your life but I, I mean I, there be, there's no reason at all I can think of for anyone to ever even do that because why would you tempt God if you honestly believe that he saved your soul at one point in your life going to have enough respect for I mean, I had respect for God before I was saved, without even knowing God. <clears throat> it's the reprobates that don't have any regard at all. I mean, I remember, I remember, I had a couple friends, we, there was a church right down, I don't know if I told this story before or not, but where I grew up, I'm sure I grew up at the end of the block, there was a church there. And I don't even know what kind of church it was, it wasn't the Baptist church, it was just some, some random church. And it didn't matter to me because as kids, we just liked to go play on the property. It's a big property on the corner, and we would just go and play and, and whatever. We'd do whatever we wanted there. The pastor lived next door now, so he didn't care that we played on the property. No big deal. And, uh, but I remember one time we were out there playing, and one of the doors was unlocked. Because normally all of the church doors are locked. And, uh, you know, so they're like, hey, check it out. You know, the doors are locked. You know, you know kids. I mean, we're like... 10 or 12 or whatever age you were and so we all go inside and the lights are all out it's just kind of you know you're you're 
you feel like it's kind of cool because you know you're not supposed to be in there, it's kind of exciting, but it's like, what are you really going to do, right? So you're kind of, I was just like running up and down like the auditorium or down the hallway or whatever. But then other people got into the refrigerator and the snacks and things like that, and they started taking it, and that's when I was just like, whoa. Now, like I said, I, it's not that that's like some big, like if some kids take some juice out of the refrigerator, like, like if someone came in here and took some waters when we weren't here because the door was unlocked, am I gonna care? Well, I mean, of course, no, <laughs> it's not gonna be a big deal, right? Someone takes some juice or some cookies or something. But that's not the point. The point is, if that's supposed to be God's house, everything that's in that house belongs to God. That is a big deal. And I think I think kids today ought to at least grow up, even the unsaved kids, the culture ought to be that you respect God. You don't do things like that. I mean, you, you go into someone's house, that's if you go into God's house, you do, and, and I remember, you know, unsaved, didn't know that much, but I knew enough to just be like, that, that's, that's crossing the line. We're not doing that. And when it comes to blasphemy, that's not even close to blaspheming the Holy Ghost. God has a line. If you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you cannot ever be saved. You've sealed your faith now and forever. It's real. There's no, there's no denying what the scripture says. But, um, you know, like I said, if, if you... Have you ever come across someone? I wouldn't waste your time on people who aren't saved trying to teach his doctrine to you. There's no point. And it's it's not worth fighting about, but if you have a friend that, that maybe you know you, you talk with and they don't believe the reverend, right probably because they've heard lies about it or whatever. It's a great place to introduce them just to the concept. And just stay focused on that point and then move on. As far as that word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for uh, <coughs> for your words. We thank you for being so merciful that you are willing to forgive people that, that have blasphemed the name of Christ. Um, I'm sure, there, I know that there's so many people in this world that have uh, foolishly blasphemed that name, that holy name, that precious name, but that you still allow them to be saved. God, I pray that you please help us to be pure in our doctrine and to be able to, to teach others, especially other brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, about this doctrine. It's a very important doctrine. There's, there's a, lot of, um, a lot of importance. It deals with salvation. It deals with um, whether or not people can even go to heaven. And it has a lot of implications on how we do things when we go soul winning and, and other things. And other, um, areas as well, and we just pray that you would please continue to open up our understanding to your words, and uh, God, we love you, we're, we were sincere, and we just want you to lead us and guide us into all truth and wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.